<laughs> Hello and welcome back. In today's video, I'm going to build a pulse generator circuit. Now, if you remember in the last Art of Electronics video, we went through theory and operation for pulse generator circuit from the Art of Electronics book. What I'm going to do in today's video is build that circuit up physically to see how it works. The pulse generator circuit that I'm referring to is this one over here. So without further hesitation, let's get going. The first circuit I'm going to build is this one right here. And this circuit I'm building is to test the pinout configuration for the 2N2222 something transistor that I randomly bought off eBay. So I need to make sure that the pinout is going to be correct. So I'll just build up the simple LED driver circuit. We did look at an LED driver circuit in question one from chapter two on the art of electronics. So we cover another circuit as well. So why not? Let me just build that circuit up. I'll show you how it works and we'll go from there. So first of all, this is my NPN transistor. I'm just going to put that up here. So for those of you who don't know, the way these breadboards work is that all the pins that are in this line are connected together. All the pins on, all the pins on this negative line are connected together. And then when you go for a row by row, that's all connected together. So I've got pin one, two, and three of this NPN transistor. So that's pin one. So everything on this row is pin one. Everything on this row is pin two. And everything on this row is pin three. So pin two of this transistor is the base. So into the base, I need to add a 10K resistor. And I need to add a switch that goes from five volts to the switch. So that's my switch over here. I'll try to keep it on the display when I press it. Now, just looking at the circuit, I have a 1K resistor from 5 volts going to an LED. So that's my 5 volt line up there. I've got my LED. On the LED itself, you need to look at the flat end, which is the cathode. So you can see that over here. So obviously that faces away from the positive voltage. So I've got my 5 volts coming in, going to the anode, and then that's the cathode. The cathode goes to the collector, so I'll do that over here. And the collector is on pin 3, so, and the emitter of the NPN transistor goes to basically straight to ground. So I'm going to move this out of the way a little bit. Pin 1 is the emitter. The emitter I need to put to the ground line, and I've got the ground line on this blue line over here. So that's basically the LED driver circuit built up. Now, if I press the switch, the LED should come on. Even if I just touch the two things together, I get the LED turning on, but it's at full brightness when I press the button. So I know the pinout for the NPN transistor is correct. Now I'm going to build up the pulse generator circuit from exercise 2.2. The pulse generator circuit is basically, the pulse generator circuit is basically this one right over here. Obviously I showed you that circuit in my previous video and I'll make sure to zoom into it. So first of all, I'm going to remove the components from the previous circuit and then I'm going to build up the circuit that you see on the screen now. To indicate if the button is pressed or not, I'm just going to add a 1K resistor and an LED to the button. So that's just a straight driven LED. And that is basically our simple circuit from question 2.2 done. So the output is on this line over here. And what I want to do is have an LED on the output line. So what I'm going to do is connect up this LED to this side over here so that's our output indication led and i want to have the resistor going from 5 volts to the led and the led is connected to the collector of the transistor so whenever the output pulse is positive our led should be on so let's now connect up 5 volts to this and see what happens so i press the button and the blue light comes on we can see a slight flicker on the red LED, which is our output LED. So when the pulse is active, the LED is off, 
but you can only see a slight thicker. So let's see why this is the case. So what you have on the screen now is two signals. The first signal is the input signal over here. And the second signal is from basically this point or the collector of Q2. I also have an LED on Q2. There's a resistor off ball with 1K value and an LED. And I'm basically recording the collector voltage on my picoscope. So the scope itself, the blue line is basically the collector of Q2 and the red line is our switch. So you can see when I press the switch, you can see that the signal or the output signal stays on for roughly eight milliseconds. And if you do our calculation, we get with an RC value of 10 kilo ohms and one microfarad, we get a time for the pulse width of 0 0.76 milliseconds. So this is probably within tolerance. So the circuit is working, but we can't see a trigger because the LED is just turning off too fast. Now to increase the time constant, we can increase the capacitance or we can increase the resistor. So the two components that I'm talking about are this capacitor down here and this 10K resistor. So if we increase the value of this or this, the time constant will change. I'm going to put another one microfarad capacitor in there. Basically just done that. And let's see what the circuit behaves like. So pressing the switch, you can see that the pulse width has doubled. So it's gone to roughly 17 milliseconds. The next thing I'm going to do is change over the 10K resistor, that's R3, to a 100 kilo ohm resistor and see what effect that has. Now there are some downsides to doing this and I'll explain them a little bit later. So I've added a 100 kilo ohm resistor right over here and now I'm going to press the switch and you can actually see the LED turn on for a fixed period of time before it comes back on. I can invert that logic with another circuit but I'm just going to show you what's on the diagram. So you can see it's gone to roughly 182 milliseconds. Now if I put in these values in here, so obviously I've got um, two microfarads and a 100 kilo ohm. That gives me 152 milliseconds when it starts to turn off. So I mean, it's approximately there. That might be some error tolerances on the resistor and things like that. Now I'm going to change the resistor back to a 10 kilo ohm and just go for a very large value um, capacitor. So what I want to do is add in a large electrolytic capacitor and you can see on this one the value of the capacitor is 470 microfarads. So I'm going to add this into the circuit but which direction do I add it? Now you can see from the circuit that this point is at 0.7 volts when this button isn't pressed and this point is at 5 volts, so that's positive. However, when you press the button, this point goes to minus 4.3 volts approximately. So this side always stays positive, so that's what I need to do for the circuit. So the collector from one side goes to the base on the other side. So I have added the 10K resistor back in, which is charging this capacitor. I've basically put a 470 microfarad capacitor in there. Now the negative side should be at 0.7 volts. The positive side of the capacitor should be at 5 volts when the button isn't pressed. I'm hoping this doesn't blow up, but I'm going to record it now and see what happens. So I've powered it on and I'm going to press the button. So you can see you've got a really long pulse now that you can actually see. Let me put that into the Excel calculator to see what that actually is. So the pulse duration over here now is 3.3 seconds. So if I put that value of the capacitor in here, so that's 470 microfarads. And a 10 kilo ohm resistor, which gives me 3.5 seconds approximately. So you can see the pulse that I have on is 3.38 seconds. So very close to what I was expecting in terms of the pulse width duration from this calculation over here, which is 0.76 times R times C. Now that we've built up a circuit that can hold the output on for a while, we can see that if you let the button go, then the output also turns off. And this is where Q3 becomes very useful. I mean, there's a lot of deep pounds on that circuit, but 
now see if i turn it off it doesn't stay on for three seconds as we expect so now what i'm going to do is add in the q3 part of the circuit and see what happens So on the board now, I've got the improved circuit with R5 and Q3 in place. So what this should do is that if we release the button, Q3 will hold this junction down to ground. So the user doesn't need to hold the push button closed and the pulse width that we need, we will get basically. So let's try that out. I'm going to basically press the button on my board and you can see the pulse duration was only this long however the output stayed on for its full pulse width calculation that we did which is roughly 3.4 milliseconds now there are a few things to look at in this there seems the led seems to stay on however it's not meant to be connected there anyway this is just for an indication for the video itself now another interesting thing to note on this circuit is if you trigger the input pulse twice which you can see i'm doing on the screen now the output pulse is its fixed duration, so it does not change. So triggering it again will not affect the length of this pulse. That's because if you look at this circuit, what you're doing is you're pressing this button and you're reducing the resistance, let's call it, of this. So you're connecting this point to ground. However, the capacitor is already connected to ground with Q3. So this button that we're pressing on our breadboard is no longer having an effect on the capacitor. So while we have the circuit built up, let's have a look at this junction over here, which is the interesting junction. So that's the base of Q2. So I'm going to load it up on the oscilloscope now. And I press the button and you can see what's happening. Let me change the trigger point for, to channel A and change it to a negative So the blue line is the base of Q2. So when I trigger the button, you can see that the base of Q2 falls to minus 4.3 volts. So side C1 will still be positive, as that will be 0 volts and that is minus 4.3 volts. Then the capacitor starts to charge up, and that is through this resistor over here, R3. And it charges up to 0.7 volts or 0.6 volts, basically the VBE voltage of Q2. And then it is no longer able to charge anymore because the VBE voltage here will hold it to 0.6 or 0.7 volts. We can see what it is. And in this case, it's 723 millivolts for this transistor. The 723 millivolts can change with temperature, with the transistor types, with the current so there's a lot of influence that happens on that 723 millivolts so you've got to be careful that you can't do accurate calculations with it but this is the charging curve of the capacitor and what we're essentially saying is that when it gets to 0.7 volts q2 turns on again and turns v out off and connects v out to ground because q2 starts to saturate don't think there's any more important junctions that we want to note on this i think that was the most interesting one so hopefully you found that useful. I think what we need to do in this circuit is add a few more bits at the end. So if you want to invert the pulse, we can do so. If we need to have a Schmidt trigger on the output, we can do that as well. So I'll build up two more circuits later on and release another video. So I hope you found that video useful. I'm going to make more videos on this circuit and basically add bits to the output. I want to try and invert the output as well so that we can tr trigger an LED easier. Obviously you saw on the circuit today that the LED turns off when we want it to turn on as that would have been a better demonstration. So we can do a simple inversion circuit, it's not too hard to do. And another thing that I want to do at the end of this is basically have a Smith trigger which is part of the Art of Electronics video anyway. So I'll explain how the Smith trigger works, basically you get two switching levels. I'll add that to the output of this circuit and it switches the output off a little bit faster as well.
So you saw in the video that the output doesn't turn off as quickly as you would like. So adding that Smith trigger circuit will help that as well. So thank you for watching today and I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any comments for me, please leave them in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.